The United States submitted its first ever appraisal of its own domestic human rights record to the Human Rights Council of the United Nations last month, citing human rights achievements as far back as abolition, but also highlighting progress made under Obama's administration on gay equality, health care, financial reform. With the announcement this week of George Soros's contribution of $100 million to the U.S.-based Human Rights Watch, we're wondering, is this a new era for human rights, or are we generally too quick to feel good about the U.S. stance? Government or NGO? Is the U.S. approach to human rights, well, right? Here to talk us through it all, we welcome Barbara Crosset, author and former foreign correspondent for The New York Times. She's right now the U.N. correspondent for The Nation and has written about the U.S. report in the current edition. And Anja Rudica, a program director at the National Economic and Social Rights Initiative, NESRI. More on that in just a bit. First, some of the response from the right on the release of the U.S. self-appraisal. I can hardly believe that the United States government would submit a report to the United Nations blaming America for human rights abuses because of some perceived difficulties with unionization. Have I got that right? Yeah, well, it truly is an outrage. An outrage. It's an outrage. The sky is falling. Barbara, the significance of this report, why is it a big deal um, for progressives and for the right, clearly? Well, I think so. I think for the right, I mean, you can see uh, it's, a, it's a big deal because somebody's paying attention to the fact that, that it's, let's be honest, it's the Obama administration uh, who in their minds is considered a foreigner or some, from some other place anyway. Um, but it, it really is a new, it's a new reporting procedure. Uh, the Human Rights Council, which replaced the completely discredited Human Rights Commission, didn't get started until 2006. And that was the Bush era. They, they actually, you know, worked against it as much as they could. The whole council idea. So last year, the Obama administration joined the Human Rights Council. And as a result, they have to get into this what's called a universal periodic review. Universal. Every country in the world, in groups, every four years has to submit a, a, a summary, basically. And um, that's how it all came about. Now, a year ago, Anya, we talked with you and Nesri nearly, I think, over a year ago about this process and about the uh, Obama administration's positioning at the United Nations, that they're going to at least participate in this. Now that the U.S. sort of self-appraisal is out, um, start with your positives. What's in it that's worth noting? Well, let's say the positive is that the report exists, that they did participate in the process, they did engage, and that's to be welcomed. And um, all of us, many hundreds of civil society organizations engaged as, as well, so we feel it's a worthwhile process, it raises awareness. However, what's in the report, I have to say, there's really not that much um, in it that actually recognizes the severe human rights problems we have in this country. Well, I think you've singled out a bunch of things, Barbara, in your nation piece. Uh, yes. Well, you know, as I said, it was kind of lawyerly. I mean, it was like citing legislation or things that are in progress uh, and some historical examples and so on. I, I think. Uh, but, you know, also the other thing that needs to be said is, of course, as Anya knows, uh, any of these human rights groups and all of them are encouraged to write separately to the Human Rights Council and take exception to the U.S. report if they want to. But I still want to hear something that's yeah. in here. <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, I can give you something that's in here, the gay, gay rights. Uh -huh. Now, as I was, uh, Anya and I were saying earlier, we were talking about this, I, I asked a friend in India who's a gay rights uh, advocate and had been one at the U.N. He's brought Kofi Annan into this issue at one point. Uh, he says it's immeasurably important to the international gay rights movement to see a statement like this Obama administration saying, you know, we had civil rights, women's rights, whatever. And this is now a, a defining mm. issue of our era. For, for many struggling organizations around the world, that's enormously important coming from the United States. Anything you'd add, Anya? Well, there's, it's certainly important to recognize that discrimination is a huge problem and that is a, a, vi a violation of human rights, uh, discrimination against every community. However, um, not only do we still have discrimination in this country against all kinds of communities, human rights also encompass the problem of deprivation, deprivation of what people need to fulfill their fundamental human needs, such as housing, healthcare, education, work with dignity. And this is where the report really, really falls short. And I think that's the most important point, that the government actually doesn't recognize that we have these social and economic rights. 
and it does everything in the report to skirt the issue. It just is, it does not come up as, as um, a principle that fundamental human needs give rise to human rights obligations on part of the government. It's not recognized. Mm. This is the sort of way that Barack Obama talks about international human rights. This is him speaking at his Nobel Peace Prize acceptance mm -hmm. ceremony last year. Take a look. For some countries, the failure to uphold human rights is excused by the false suggestion that these are somehow Western principles, foreign to local, local cultures or stages of a nation's development. And within America, there's long been a tension between those who describe themselves as realists or idealists, a tension that suggests a stark choice between the narrow pursuit of interests or an endless campaign to impose our values around the world. So how do you see that kind of language, which is part of what's motivating this report, um, as articulating some of what you're concerned about, Anya. Like, where would you he like to hear it spoken about differently, human rights? Well, maybe it's not about how you speak about it, but it is what you actually do. And it is, it is true that it's, it's a crucial a point that human rights start here at home, they start locally, they start in our communities, and that is what the government needs to recognize. And while this speech sort of pays lip service to that, we don't see any of that in the report. I mean, there have been hundreds and hundreds of people at these consultations with the government voicing their concerns over human rights violations, people that engage in struggle every day. And it's not reflected. You wouldn't know that if you read the report well, that should, they actually spoke to people. We should say that we'll put a link on our website um, accompanying this conversation to that show where we talked about how people were gathering in community centers all around the country. Um, Barbara, your, your input on this. I mean, it's a first step clearly but what well, were you yeah, looking no, for? No I, I totally agree that the United States but really since the beginning except for Eleanor Roosevelt has been resistant to equating economic and social rights with civil and political uh, rights or liberties and so this has been a consistent problem for people who are pushing this. I mean recently the General Assembly passed a resolution on the right to water and sanitation um, it, it has no enforcement, neither does the Human Rights Council, I might add, once they come and review the American report. I mean, it's just out there for the world to see, and that in itself is interesting for the world, right. but not satisfying to the people at home. But when Obama's, when the administration touts its, for example, health care reform, isn't that kind of an economic or social right? Well, it is, but right is the, is the, is the critical word. We, we're talking about something that is a fundamental right, um, like a free press or whatever. It, it almost belongs, in other words, in the Bill of Rights. And that's where the U.S. has always stopped short. Two high commissioners for human rights recently have, have pushed this issue again, that these things are, should be rights. But in every country, they're hard to do. In India, now they're fighting over the right to food. Is there, can you do such a thing? Right as ensure the right to food. And could you have a right to health care and still make it for profit? Yeah, can I, can I add to that? It's, it's about um, it being a right, but it's also about exactly not being for profit. Because one of the reasons why the government shies away from acknowledging uh, economic and social rights in this country is because they don't want to acknowledge that um, market forces are out of control. And instead, in this um, health care reform, they push more money into the market instead of um, giving it to, so to people's universal health care How do they needs. talk about it in the report? We expanded coverage, period? Well, they don't acknowledge that, the, that there's fundamental inequalities in the society, that the market has a lot to do with that. The market is unable to meet people's needs. It exacerbates human rights abuses. And they don't acknowledge the responsibility they have to everybody in this country, that, universal rights, that, uni, uh, that human rights are universal. They're universal, they're equitable, and they must be accountable um, to all of us as the, as, as the people. And that's just what's not happening. They're going for these selective market-based programs rather than a universal um, measure treating health care as a public good where everybody is in the same common pool. And then there comes the question of labor rights, which comes in for some criticism in, in this report and horrified people on the right. Let's play another clip from that same Fox uh, News show, which sadly was one of the few places that actually covered the it, release it of this was, report. And as, I, and as I said, it set off people like Governor Brewer. Let's talk about it when we come back. Take a look. The fact is, 
It is the hardest country in the free world to organize unions is the United States of America. We are the greatest democracy. So you report That's us to the United us. Nations. And so it is you it, report us to the United Nations, report, a den of thieves. It's called, and you say that we're I don't call the UN a den of thieves, you don't. Stuart. I don't. I do. But it also oh, is I transparency do, and bringing the public spotlight to these issues. The fact yes, is, you've embarrassed us. You have embarrassed, embarrassed us. That, it's, bringing the it's public spotlight, you have embarrassed America. I think it's embarrassing. You have sided with our enemies. No, That's the nature of the discourse. <laughs> right. And as you right. said, Jambro of Arizona freaked out also. Because he, it, was, it did mention Arizona by name as a problem in the on the immigration front. So, uh, so what happens next is my question. If this already creates that kind of a firestorm, what happens next? And then I want to talk about this hundred million going to the mm -hmm. Human Rights Watch. How does that change or affect this picture? Well, I don't, I don't know that it will affect the picture internationally. I leave that to Anya. What, you mean next with this report? Right. Um, in, in November, they will collect reports from groups like Anya's and, and from uh, three outside observers. I think that's Japan, France, and Cameroon, <clears throat> countries who have a right to look at the U.S. report and then say what they thought, or the U.S. And now those are three countries that aren't going to, you know, throw grenades. And, um, and then uh, the, the Human Rights High Commissioner also gets to put her two cents in. And then the whole thing comes together, it just gets presented to the Human Rights Council, and um, it becomes a worldwide document. And you know, nobody reads it in the United States, but millions, mm. hundreds, billion maybe people will read it around the, the world. The hundred million from Soros to Human Rights Watch, is this good or not good for, well, human rights? Well, what, what we need in this country is a grassroots movement for bringing human rights home, not having them seen as something international for the recognition of economic and social rights. I have no idea what you know an infusion of money will do in that, that part. Um, I know that the focus is still very much on the international level. It's on political and civil rights. But where we need it is really to, to point out that what's, what we've seen in these clips, it's a disgrace that the government does not really take care of these human rights at home and not that um, we're reporting on the government's failure so that we don't have um, the, the right to organize in most workplaces here. That is a human rights disgrace. So we really need to turn the table in this dialogue. Anya, Barbara, thank you so much for joining us. There are links to Anya's work with Nesri and to Barbara Crossite's article in The Nation at grittv.org.